Jordan, thanks so much for the time. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to dive right in. Um, a lot of times we get asked this question before diving into the models themselves. So I'd like to provide a really quick, uh, just a high level overview. Um, PLOS knows it's very much implicated in the development of a business model via APCs that excludes uh, folks via creating a barrier to publishing. So we want to be part of the solution that is uh, experimenting with models that move away from APCs or integrate APCs in other ways. Um, we obviously need to have a competitive offering to many of the other publishers out there that are engaging in these models, making it essentially free for their authors. Um, if PLOS wants to stick around, we need to remain competitive in that space. And we wanna demonstrate that these models work uh, and that other um, institutions, hopefully other publishers would consider uh, experimenting them much with the success that uh, Richard and annual reviews have had with other people taking up subscribe to open. The whim chimes are from me, guys. Sorry, that's coming from my, uh, I'm sitting outside. So if that's super annoying, I will uh, go back inside. Just let me know. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the flat fee models that we've developed, there's actually two. I'll focus on community action publishing today, but we actually have two separate models that work very much like what Scott um, shared, uh, are really predicated on uh, spending about nine months talking to libraries across the globe about their needs. Uh, having been multiple years in now to, um, using flat fees as excuse me using apcs as the primary mechanism for handling um oa so the next slide kind of walks through the feedback that we got um for both models so on the left hand of the screen we have what we call a very sexy name flat fees uh that relates to unlimited publishing in our mega journal plus one and our community journals so you pay one time annually the same amount each year you get unlimited publishing in those titles community action publishing Publishing pulls out our two highly selective journals, PLOS Medicine and PLOS Biology, because we were trying to solve slightly different problems with that experimental pilot, um, and we have different mechanisms around it. So first, I just want to talk about the rationale, and then I'll dive into how they work. So if you can um, just follow me through, each one of these is going to um, uh, animate separately. So the, the main feedback we got around flat fees was the APC admin um, went from being a nice idea to the kind of thing where you have teams in the UK and Northern Europe of five, six, seven people whose pure focus is managing APCs, figuring out who paid, who didn't, what grant money was used, checking reporting, hundreds of publishers, thousands of papers. Um, it's a nightmare. It's a big part of why OA Switchboard um, uh, came into, into being. Uh, this feedback was pretty much consistent. Uh, thankfully, funders are increasingly willing to support other models, but we're going to come back to this. As long as funders are largely wedded to APCs as the mechanism by which they support OA, we're going to have a problem shifting from models that don't use APCs that are more like flat fees. So I'll come back to that. Thankfully, funders are starting to consider it. And then there are issues with deals that have publishing caps. Um, we've heard, we're hearing a little bit about um, the Wiley JISC deal, certainly um, agreements we've seen in Germany have had these issues. Nobody wants to run out of those free publications. So having models that are predicated um, on a ballpark uh, publishing volume above which you exceed uh, capping out is a problem. And so we, we took that into account. On the community action publishing side for PLOS Medicine and Biology, uh, you can click through, David, thank you. The goal with this model was a different question. So our issue here was we have journals that are expensive to produce because they're highly selective. We know from our communities that those journals are valued. How do we make them open access without falling into the, well, if you want them open, you're going to pay $6,000. Uh, we decided that the argument of high APCs for highly selective journals is the only way we wanted to disprove that. And so the goal was, can we make highly selective OA um, APC free uh, whilst also covering cost? Because those two journals have been subsidized by PLOS One uh, to keep their APCs low. So basically what we did is we make publicly available the total cost and margin that we're trying to cover for both of those two journals. Uh, it's public on our site. We uh, worked with libraries like MIT and many others to come up with an equitable distributed tiering system that takes that cost, distributes it amongst institutions. Institutions pay an annual flat fee for unlimited publishing in those two titles. 
one of the the two big innovations with this model um, relate to the author um, attribution, uh, which David flagged. So this is the first model that I'm aware of that not only looks at the affiliation of the lead author, but also the affiliation of the contributing authors. And we think this is really important because contributing authors are bringing as much to a paper as the lead author. So in the shift to, to move away from, you know, legacy forms of research assessment, we think we do need to be looking at what contributing authors do, but they also have a benefit as a publishing, as, as part of a publishing group. And there, there's also a cost uh, that comes for contributing authors and institutions need to start thinking about what it means to take on that cost. So this model looks at the publishing activity as reflected by affiliation of both lead and contributing authors. If you are a member of the community when your authors publish, uh, they have no fees. If your institution chooses not to become a member, that's totally fine. Your authors are subjected to non-member fees that we are raising aggressively year over year to eventually just be the cost each paper um, would cost to, to publish. Any revenue above that total target that we're making publicly um, available would be redistributed back to members in the form of discounts. So much like the ACM model, cap is capped. The margin is capped, the number of articles in those journals are going to be capped, and the goal is to cover the cost prudently and, and redistribute funds back. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you can click through on all of these. This is basically the, the bare bones. Um, unlimited publishing for a fee. Uh, on the left, the flat fees are really just focusing on a tiered mechanism um, by which you, you pay one fee and you publish as much as you want. The, uh, the journals on the, the community action publishing journals uh, have a little bit more uh, nuance there, but essentially from the library perspective, again, it's one fee for unlimited publishing. Next slide. Um, it's important to stress this, I think, as the as the native OA publisher on the on the panel, that these are not licensing agreements. There is no read component in these. PLOS is open access CCBY. Um, and so some of the things, for example, that Scott mentioned that are included in all their agreements, PLOS doesn't do. Um, we don't uh, do deposition into institutional repositories. Um, there's a number of, of things you would have looked for in a long licensing agreement that you won't see because our content is natively open. I'm happy to dive into that detail and discussion, but I just want to reiterate the obvious that these aren't license agreements and some of that licensing brain kind of needs to go away when thinking about um, native OA publishers. Next slide, please. Um, so infrastructure and challenges. Yeah, I'll dive into those. Um, the next slide I'll kind of go through what uh what i think i actually yeah david just go ahead and advance sorry i can't remember what, what was on this there we go right so um for plos specifically it's funny to hear the challenges um and I, scott shared these many times that they've faced because ours are kind of the reverse going in the opposite direction right so plos is optimized from for retail you know small dollar amounts high volume authors as the primary customer. Now we have to shift to larger, a mixed model where we have larger agreements B2B with libraries and we need to have the ability to support um, the way libraries expect to do business whilst also having that retail business going on simultaneously. So there's a very big infrastructure lift that comes with a lot of cost um, that lifting the hood and explaining to libraries has been a really interesting process, whether it's been the negotiation with CDL or MIT or others. Data quality is critical to this. Like Scott said, um, the biggest lift for the CAP model was the hundreds of hours of data cleanup to get institutional affiliations for co-authors and lead authors. Um, a huge lift and a huge tension between the commercial part of the business that's thinking about these kinds of things and the editorial part of the business that just wants to make the submission process as smooth as possible. Do we wanna force authors to uh, share grant IDs and um, uh, fund ref stuff? Do we wanna force authors to tell us how are you paying, who is funding it? There's a tension there um, that, that we haven't solved uh, that makes making this data as clean as possible more difficult. Uh, certainly shared standards are a huge issue. Um, our agreements uh, are very short. There's no read component to our agreements. Um, there's a case to be made that if our model works, our contracts work, perhaps another native OA publisher might use the same um, contract uh, or, or definitions even, um, or reporting standards such that what libraries experience is the same and we can develop a bit of scale um, from some of that efficiency. 
and then a big thing for PLOS, which um, may seem kind of counterintuitive, but is a huge one, is really before I came to PLOS, there were very few folks uh, there who had a lot of um, engagement with libraries. So understanding the priorities, what the things that are top of mind, you know, when Courtney comes to me with a set of questions uh, from the MIT libraries, we need more people within PLOS to understand what those questions are about, what's driving them. Um, and so that's a, that's a growth process we're in the process of right now. Last slide. So the questions I like to, to pose to the various stakeholders um, in the room uh, today are uh, fourfold. So for funders, the big question I have to you is how are you, how are you going to support how authors pay fees? If the in insistence is we are going to embed APC funds within grant funds, there isn't enough money in the system. Um, until libraries can somehow unlock the money that authors are getting from grants. You have this problem where that money is locked away and the library is trying to find new money in the case of PLOS, they've never paid for us before in the past, new money to support publishing. Um, models like California's speak, start to speak to this. PLOS has an iteration of our flat fee model, which tries to speak to maintaining the grant funding from authors. But ultimately it'd be really interesting to see funders consider other ways of, of injecting fees in that don't lock us into author by author by author. Consortia, just flagging that um, the scaling issues that consortia have mean that small publishers can really be left out in the dust. Um, we, we, it makes total sense that a consortia doesn't have time to talk to one tiny society publisher about two journals that each cost $500, but we really have to think about what the impacts are for the publishing ecosystem if those tiny, tiny um, organizations can't get a foot in the door with the big consortia that can make these deals scale. Um, libraries just uh, always reminding that these are not um, licensing agreements. And so what shifts need to be made on the library side to accommodate the new workflows and new ways of thinking about models that you haven't had to before when you've been thinking about licensing. Um, and then researchers, you know, how much, how much information are you willing to provide? If we're not willing to push researchers on using persistent identifiers, uh, telling us how they're paying from what source of funding, the data is never going to be clean enough to make this scalable. And I, I think probably every publisher would agree, short of the infrastructure that has to be changed internally to make this business possible, the data cleanup, the data lift, the data hygiene um, makes or breaks all of these models. And um, we need to help each other out, but we also need the, the authors to do their part there. And I think I'm at time, so I'll stop there. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, there are a couple of questions for you in the Q&A. Um, my quick comment is just, um, really interesting the idea of the grant funds being locked away from the libraries and thinking about how you might you know I mean many funders are willing to um, say oh well you know here's money in your grant to pay an APC or to pay for publishing um, and just thinking in terms of so much of a grant is going to also include overhead you know are there ways to shift publishing expenses away from here are the funds that go directly to the researcher or the laboratory to this is now a chunk that goes into overhead that goes to your institution for for you know managing on that level um is that, I, should add, I should add david some some um funders welcome comes to mind um ukri are starting to think about those shifts and and are engaging with our model to make that possible but if they hadn't been for example that JISC agreement never would have been possible so you know just calling out the ones who are starting to think about it yeah i think it's you know it's interesting in things of you know if, it, if it's just coming out of the same pool of overhead the institutions are not going to be happy but if it's money coming away from the researchers to go into overhead then the researchers aren't going to be happy so somebody's going to have to uh, to compromise somewhere in there 